It's Tuesday, and you know what that means, a new episode of No Filter. Yes, indeed, she is a fashion icon. She is a legend, a feminist, and someone that I've known my whole career of modeling, yeah. She's revolutionized the way women wear a dress, with a wrap dress, which is sexy and versatile, easy to pack. She has worked in the style industry in various capacities, ever since she's done the fashion perfumes, luggages, accessories, shoes. She's launched a home collection. She also was the president of the Council of Fashion Designers of America for 13 years. She's literally seen it and done it all. And I really mean that when I say done it all. And she is a real life princess, but never uses that title, but she is. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the one and the only Princess Diane von Furstenberg. Diane von Furstenberg, but we should say Princess Diane von Furstenberg because you are a princess. Well, I don't know. I, I, I married <laughs> a princess. So I guess I am a princess, but... You are um, a princess, and you've never, you never used it, but you are. Okay, so we'll go for that. So Where it's are nice you? to How see are you. How are you? And welcome to No Filter. Thank you. It's nice to see you. And uh, yes, I do know you uh, since you were a teenager. And uh, I've always, and I did take you to lunch one day, and uh, you had just arrived in New York, I think. And I took you to lunch, and what did I tell you? You told me about business. You asked me what I like to do. We spoke about doing wigs. I mean, you right away made me think that even though I just come into modeling, you already were kind of angling me to think of other things around modeling. And you took me to that lovely restaurant. Where there were only men. Only men. <laughs> the Four Seasons on 52nd. And I was just like, oh my goodness, I'm so in awe. And I remember telling my boyfriend at the time, which was Bobby, I'm going to lunch with Diane von Furstenberg. And it was this long, 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 long skinny thing, all dressed in black. And every man in the room said, oh my God, who is this goddess? Oh no, they must have thought I was a complete dork. No. Because no. I was just, I mean, New York was just so exciting to be in New York. I and to When be was it? In Where? the 90s? 86. 86 I arrived. So I wow. Think, yeah, I think it was between the end of 86, beginning of 87. All right. Definitely so was a, a teenager. Long time ago. Yeah. And basically, I told you, I don't know what I told you, <clears throat> but uh, I guess that I told you in, in a weird way, without knowing it, that own it was the secret of life and this year i during the pandemic i did this little book which is the publisher had come to me and they had uh, said you know people you know people want to know about your wisdom you get advice to everyone people quote which you which is the true time. you do so i would we would like you to make this these little books that are self-help books that people love and originally it was supposed to be called In Charge, right? Because mm -hmm. In Charge was always the umbrella uh, above me, right? When people would say, what did you want to do when you were growing up? And I said, well, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I knew the kind of woman I wanted to be. I yeah. wanted to be a woman in charge. And then later when people would ask me, who do you dress? I would say the same thing the women in charge. Yeah. So I didn't, in charge was always kind of this umbrella. And so they wanted me to do this book called In Charge. Then I realized that In Charge could be, it, you know, can appear to be, um, how can I say, uh, aggressive. Mm -hmm. But to be in charge is actually not aggressive. A commitment to ourselves. It's owning who we are. We own our imperfection, 
they become our assets. We own our vulnerability, we turn it into strength. So mm. own it is, so then I decided to call the book Own It. And I made it as a dictionary. So, because I when I thought- I Own It speaks to you much better, Dad, because it's something you tell us all. And I think it's kind of a little hard to start have the title of the book before you, maybe for some people, but with you, you're so hands-on and the more you speak to you, the more ideas come to you for that person. I think you, each person you talk to as an individual is not the same advice across the board. So but, it's right. So that's why. So and I started to write as a, as a normal book, and when I was reading it, it was so condescending. So what I did is I took a big uh, copy book, and I wrote all the words that speak to me. Uh, and sometimes some that don't speak to me alphabetically. And this little book is like a dictionary. It yeah. has 268 words. Mm -hmm. And all, everyone will, sometimes it's just a definition, sometimes it's an anecdote, but right. all of it brings you to own it. So, you want me to read you one? Yes, please. Okay, we'll start with the letter A. And because it was the pandemic, okay, so you could choose awareness alone, authenticity, allure, age, abundance, autumn, attention, advocacy, attitude, anger, addiction. Authenticity, please. Okay, authenticity. Nothing is more attractive and powerful than authenticity. It is the essence of who we really are and so much better than any imitation. Amen to that. Oh, this book is good. I like that you can pick it up and just find what you can it is go that you any, for any, now at that moment. Exactly. And you can have it by your side table and you open it and you just go for it. Fake. Being fake is like having an imposter living inside ourselves, bringing only insecurity, unhappiness, and endless misunderstanding. And total fear and doubt. But wait, Thank Diane, you. we have to do like we do here in No Thoughts. We okay. need to start from sorry, the beginning. Sorry. First of all, where were you born and where did you grow up? All right. I was born in Belgium. Mm -hmm. uh, both my parents were kind of refugees. My mother had come for, as a child from Greece. My father came as a student from Russia, Romania. And, uh, and I was born in Belgium. But if you talk about my childhood, I think it's really important to talk about my mother mm -hmm. and the fact that uh, before I was born... I know she's a survivor my mother was uh, was arrested in occupied uh, belgium she spent 13 months in concentration camp and when she was liberated she weighed 45 pounds so i she wasn't supposed to survive she wasn't supposed to she did get married after but she wasn't supposed to have a child until much later and yet i was born so the fact that my mother was a survivor, that I wasn't supposed to be born, explained very much the kind of person that I am. Wow, so you have a very, you've come from a woman of strength, of perseverance, of hope. Yes, and of uh, refusing to be and a resist victim. And resilience. Refusing to be a victim, no matter what. And that is what she taught me. Fear was not an option. If I was afraid of the dark, she locked me in the black, in the dark closet. Today she would go to jail. But as a result, I'm not afraid. And she made me fearless. And therefore, I am very thankful for that. She used to tell me, God saved me so that I can give you life. By giving you life, you gave me my life back. You are my torch of freedom. So I was born with a torch of freedom in my hand. 
which could be heavy for a little girl, but that also explained my life. Well, it explains your life, but explains you as a woman, because you have your victim doesn't even sit nowhere near you. It's you are such a force, Diane. Really, I mean. I think of the first time I've met you. I think of, I've known you throughout my whole career, through my teens, I through know. my 20s, through my 30s, through my 40s, and now my 50s. And you've just always remained consistently the same. But, you know, I love our times of when I just come over to your place and sit at the end of your bed and you'll just be like, okay, just, you know, checking in, let's have a little, our little talks. Those are quality times. Those really matter. Those are very special moments. Of checking in is, with you and and this is like what life is about you know life is about intimacy i don't like small talk either you're working and mm -hmm. so if you're working you're selling and blah 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 but if you're not working then i like intimacy i like intimate i don't like small talk and you and i have had we have met all through the years You've done a lot of my shows, open the shows, end up the shows. When I was in Moscow, you were so nice to me. You took care of me. Because you I were was so there. thrilled when I saw you were coming to Moscow. I was like, this is my town now. I have to be there. I, have to I do know. That. You were very, what a great exhibition, everybody, by the way. I know. You were very kind to me. I will. I will very innovative. That. That, that, you should, that, that exhibition should be back going around because it's, I love how innovative it was. You really yeah. felt the journey of your whole career. I know. I know. And it was actually, it was Natalia's idea. She said, what are you going to do? Because I was going to Russia to open something. And I said, I don't know. I'm going to do a fashion show. She said, no. You, you know, people are so intrigued by who you were in the 70s. You should do a little exhibition. Yeah. And so it was her idea, actually. She's absolutely right. They want to see your journey. They want to see. But it also gives hopes to so many who want to follow in your footsteps, in design, in all that you've achieved and accessories and all the businesses you've entered into. So you always used to say to me, count on you, you always used to say, you know, if I picked up the phone and called you, and there was an instance I picked up the phone and called you on your very last um, year of CFDA, and you came through with that. You were like, you have not what? I'll take care of that. And I, was, and I knew then, Diane said she's taking care. She's taking care. Well, I love you. I love you, and uh, and the feeling I mean, is mutual. I love you too. Yeah, I love you because from the beginning I could tell you know that you were special, and from the beginning we had an intimate relationship. So even if we don't see each other a lot, we still I know that you're only one email away, and that I can call on you anytime, and you know the same thing about me. Absolutely. And I think that what is important about, you know, you speaking and you doing this, this, these interviews and everything, what I think is important is that because you're successful, because I, I, you know, I'm successful, we have a voice. And when you have a voice, it is important to use your voice, your experience, your knowledge, your, your, your memories, you, everything, you, you, your connection, in order to help others to be, you and I have one thing in common. We became the woman we wanted to be, right? Mm -hmm. So Correct. it is our duty and our privilege to talk about it, to talk about the insecurities, to talk about the vulnerability. You, you, I love the way you give back. I mean, we got to cover a little bit here. So you have seen all of it. You've done the glamorous life. You went to the Studio 54. You've been through all of it. Diane, you know so many. You've seen so much, many lives over for many of us. Tell me, please just give us a little insight. What was it like in the 80s? What was it like to step in Studio 54? Okay. So uh, to arrive in New York in the 70s was the funnest thing you could possibly imagine. New York was dangerous. New York was cheap. And because it was cheap, 
you had so many artists, you had so many people, so many creative people. As a woman, it was, oh, there was the beginning of women liberation, as a, uh, it was also the sex liberation. We didn't know anything about AIDS. It was this moment in history between the invention of pill and, and, and the coming out of AIDS. So mm -hmm. we were very, very free. And then there was Studio 54, which was the funnest nightclub ever. But the Studio 54, even though it has this huge thing, this huge fame, only lasted, I think, two and a half years. Uh, that was it? Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, a lot of things happened in there. But anyway, so it was a real fun time to be in New York. Yes. And to be young in the 70s was very good. And to be in fashion was very interesting because the 70s is like the 30s. There's mm. those decades that don't go out of style, right? The 70s mm. is still glamorous. The 30s is still glamorous. Absolutely. You then met people, other, other designers in fashion, obviously, but all the artists like Basquiat, you knew all of these people. They were all your friends. You're one of the legendary ones that are still here today. <laughs> I know. Sometimes I feel like, you know, I talk to people and I say, oh my God, it's like now this Holston film came out, you know, I knew everybody. And How almost did you feel everybody. About it? Did you watch it? Yes, I did watch it. It was very good. It was very good. I mean, some things were, because I know every single person, of course, some were came out better than others. But it was good. It, it did give, give very much the feeling of the era, yes. I felt like you and McGregor was amazing. He kept his character. Amazing. He, yeah. he was really, really good. He's a great actor. Yeah. But I don't remember ever hearing that Calvin and Halston were, were they friends? They were friends, no? Or was there competitiveness? Uh, I don't know if they were friends. They were contemporaries. And... Uh, I maybe I could see that Holston was jealous of Calvin because when Calvin came about and they, he had this big moment of glory, um, I mean they were competitive, you know, in fashion everyone is competitive. And then of course you knew people like Dino Ross, Grace Jones, Cher, Barry Manilow. Who did you, Debert Diane? I mean. Michael Jackson. You've met everyone. Uh, yes. You really have met everyone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have. Other things that you do that I want people to be aware of is, and I've had the honor to be invited to those wonderful events that you did of DVF, your foundation at the United Nations, where you would give those awards to young women in emerging markets, especially that I loved. I, lo I was so honored I got to go with, you invited me with Hillary Clinton, Gloria Steinberg, Cardi Kloss. It was such a great evening and really, really just something to be, felt good to be at, felt wonderful to hear, to see the progress that people are getting in other, are doing in other parts of the world. Yes, the DVF Award is something I created 11 years ago and it's really, uh, the reason is to highlight these incredible women who who do so much work, who have had the strength to fight, the courage to survive, and the uh, leadership to inspire. And in order to highlight these women, I, we give them our foundation, we give them money, we support them, and I want to highlight them. And in order to highlight them, of course, I need people to invite people like you, that bring, you know, that bring attention. And uh, last year, last year when we, we did the last one, it was in DC and the big prize went to RBG, uh, Ruth Ginsburg. And that was really nice. And it turned out to be the last right. public uh, appearance Event that she of did. 2020, yeah. Yeah. Now, you've always been someone that's been always aware and always, been supportive of diversity inclusion. So no one can ever say to you that you've never done that. I can say that from my standpoint. How do you feel when you see our business today 
and what it's gone through. Obviously, you're very close to know Beth Ann and Iman. And what we've had to ask for and be involved in the CFDA, being the head of the CFDA, what do you feel? Do you feel like we've improved? We've got a ways to go? Of course, you. Yeah, of course it has improved. I think, and also, you know, this new generation, this Gen Z, because I have two granddaughters who are in that generation. I mean, for them, it's so normal, you know, the inclusiveness. And I never really realized how, how racist people were, you know, and uh, and how off everything was. And I remember Bethan, and I remember, you know, Iman, you you were the groundbreaking, you know, you were you were the the lead and the shining light for so many. But now it's it, yes, I think we are making progress. I think we should. I mean, I, you know. Um, I, I, for me, I, can, I, I don't even understand why not, you know, yeah. it's uh, one of those things. And, uh, but it is exciting. It is exciting to have Kamala Harris as a vice president. That is exciting. Now, as well as supporting people in the fashion creative side, Diane also supports, you support a lot of people in the tech side. I mean, I only recently in the last couple of years gone to been invited to some of these wonderful events. And you have been there, from what I've been told, front and center from the day they were born, these inceptions of bringing people together, being at Google Camp, being at uh, Cannes Liars, being at Brilliant Minds. And, you know, you really, you go from, you cross all borders. You don't, there is no wall for you. And you've been supportive to so many young emerging people and creatives in tech. Could you tell us a bit about that and how you started to get into that? Listen, I, I love living my time, right? I mean, and I have, I've lived, I'm 74 and I've lived so fully that I should be 150. You know, because I am curious, because I want to know, because I want to learn, because I surround myself with young people over and over, always, because I want to learn and I want to share what I know and share my experiences. Uh, because of Barry and for a multitude of reasons, uh, I met a lot of the tech, uh, tech people and I am fascinated by tech, you know, and... Um, for example, during the pandemic, two things happened. Everybody got closer to nature. So if you had a garden, you really appreciate your garden because you really. And on the other side, we, we were accelerated five to 10 years in the virtual world. So there's nature and there's the virtual world. And somehow they're getting closer. What is very important about the tech world is that because the virtual world is happening and because AI and all of that, what I realize is that there's not enough feminine energy in that. And if you program all these AI and the people who program, we don't yeah. have the feminine energy, then we, we will lose everything we've done. And one very close friend of mine, Sam Altman, who is very advanced in AI, I said to him, you know, in AI, you have to put all the books uh, written by women, all the books about women, character. And uh, so it's very, very important that we don't forget to put the feminine energy into the virtual world. When were you ever underestimated as a woman and how did that make you feel? You know, because of my mother, she always told me that it was to be a woman was a privilege, you know. So I never thought that. And then I, because I worked, I had only one job. And then after that, I worked for myself. I never really felt glass ceiling and all of that. And in fashion, to be a woman designer was, you know, not a disadvantage. But what I did realize is, and it, it's only lately that I realized how much 
you know, for a woman who is a journalist and who works so hard and mm. studies and blah, 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 then she ends up having a great job for a great journalist and then she's being abused. And that mm -hmm. is unacceptable. And yeah, so yeah. we have to fight against inequality, abuse, and violence. Now, you were on the cover oh. of Newsweek. What was that like? 1976, yeah. I was in the cover of News, Newsweek. And that same week, uh, there was a girl in a, in a Holston bathing suit. So Holston and I, we were on the cover. He was on the cover of Time. I was on the cover of Newsweek. I was 28 years old. And they didn't believe I was 28. They went to Belgium to check my birth certificate because they didn't believe I was 28. No way. And it was a very special moment. It was, it was a very <laughs> special week. And that week I went to the White House. That moment is the moment that I had become the woman I wanted to be. By the way, uh, what, what, how old were you when you became the woman you wanted to be? Hmm. Let's say 30. When I felt so the like, same as me. Yeah, yeah. 29. I'm starting to understand about how I need to be with myself. Th 29, 30. Yeah. Then having great. to so so acknowledging it in my mind, understanding how I have to do it, and then at the point of that was the point where I need to take the action into doing it. It's also very important to be able to look oneself in the mirror and admit to one's faults, one's insecurities. It's okay. It's all right. You know what I mean? It's that's like what this that that's what that's what this little book is about. It to own it. Doesn't matter what happened to you. You are diagnosed with something unpleasant. Your boyfriend leaves. Whatever it is, got to connect the here. One thing to do is own it. Own it. Okay, this is what happened. I own it, and then the minute you own it, you're in charge, because your character is the only thing that you absolutely have hundred percent control of. Absolutely you could lose right. your health. You could lose your wealth. You could lose your beauty, you could lose your family, you could lose your freedom, but you You're never, right. ever lose your character. So now you mentioned Barry, and when Diane mentions Barry, she's talking about her wonderful husband, Sir Barry Dillard, I call him, who is a visionary at that. I mean, I'm looking at the island that you both are coming up on the West Side Highway, that in itself is a piece of art. And I feel like when you move to 14th Street, the High Line, you also were supportive of the High Line and making that happen, which is something big for New York City. And now you're doing this island. Can you explain to us? Yes. So about 20 years ago, uh, when I started my company again that I had sold and they had ruined, I wanted, I didn't want to stay uptown in some office building. And I thought, but did you, you know what, something? Did you have any fear when you had to restart your business again? Yeah, but fear is, as I told you, my mother told me fear is not an option, right? Yeah. So I, I, it took me so long to get my name back and this and that. So when I started, I started with a bunch of young girls. I was 50 then. Everybody else was 25. I thought I was their age. And we moved. And then I, no, no. I thought, okay. Are... And I took, a, I found a carriage house in the West Village on, on 12th Street. And I bought that little building. And everybody said, you're crazy. They were only butchers. And it was smelled bad. Nobody wants to work there, blah, blah, blah. And I moved there. And when you move in a new neighborhood, you make friends. And, and there was a diner called Florent. And Florent, there I met I two Florent. guys, Florent. Yeah. And then I met these guys who had the, a dream of turning this old elevated railroad into a park. And they said, 
can we do our, our first uh, fundraiser in your building? And I said, yes. And that's how I got involved with them. And we ended up actually financing most, uh, the, we were the larger financing. But by the time it started, uh, it, it became the number one, the number one destination for tourists in New York. The High Line. And uh, so that was that. And then, then Barry moved on downtown also. And his, his offices, he had Frank Gehry do this beautiful building. And so he moved there too. And then, and then after the High Line, I got involved with the Statue of Liberty. And yes. then somebody came to Barry and say, will, will you save this old pier? And he said, an old pier? And then he looked at it, he said, well, does it have to stay a long tri a rectangle or can we make something out of it? And that's when they had the idea, he had the idea. It of looks turning stunning it into and it looks, what a treat for New York City this is gonna be. Just oh for the goodness. public, there is no opening, there's nothing, it just opens. And not only it's a beautiful park on a little island. I but heard you've got theaters too open air theater and when that's where my husband is visionary because when he started that we all said in, with him and the family why do we need the theater why do we need to do the production and this and that and he insisted on it and now obviously after the pandemic that people exactly. have no theater that people don't want to go inside all of a sudden he will have created this and it's i'm going to show you a picture it's and incredible. It is really, He's so ahead of his time. Yeah. What a genius, Barry. Davis. I know. What a genius. I know. And always been so sweet to me. That always, always, always. And this was taken from a helicopter. Wow. Now I've gotten to see this. I've passed this so many times because I live further down, and it's just it's it's so. I was always saying, "What is that?" And you know, now I can't wait to get back to go there. What a treat. What a special gift to give New York City, especially at this time without even knowing that this was going to happen. You know? I now, know. we're going to go back to Own It because Own It, you wrote all, you started Own It through the pandemic. You've done everything through the pandemic. You started rewriting it through the pandemic, promoting it through the pandemic. I mean, I know that this has been a very, difficult time for a lot of people, but I also know it's been a time of reflection, of, it's been a positive time for some too. I mean, in terms of the lives that we've lost, that's tragic. But I also know that this pandemic has yes. been- Yes, no, it forced us to pause. And we all live a world that we never stop. We went there, we went there, three days there, two days there, na, 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 na. And now, all of a sudden, we had to pause. I was in my home that I bought myself when I was 27 years old. This was the first time that I couldn't move. I was lucky because I have a garden. And if you have a garden, it's a lot easier. And so it was time. I mean, it was an opportunity, this forced pause, to think about what matters most. And what in your life doesn't make sense anymore? Because even business model, some business model don't make sense anymore, but you just do it and it's like one thing after the Agreed. other, after the other, after the other. And so what, I mean- You become an autopilot. I don't want to say, that's right. So I think that if something so unexpected happens to you, uh, happens, you have to say, Embrace. okay, this is meant for me to learn and yes. then you learn i agree and you have to embrace it you have to embrace it you oh, can't no. fasten it up you can't slow it down you just have to go with it it's much it's 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 easier to do it that way i totally agree diane what will you say to all those young creators out there who have watched you who have lived and followed your journey who was inspired by you and what you do today and all walks of creatives. What's your advice today in, to the world? Because you're someone, we could be having my, lunch in Qatar with 
Her Highness Sheikh Hamosa to, you know. And all these people look up to you and respect you. So what would you, what would you be your words of wisdom? What would I say? I said that looking back, what I, I, what was the best thing about my life is that I never lied. I have never lied and I've never lied to myself. And practicing the truth is the most important and valuable thing you could do. And it's not easy. And I don't know why it happened to me, but I did that. And that's why I say everything is about owning it. Be who you are. Be who you are. I mean, an owner, do you have a big nose? But you know what? The minute you own it, everybody would say, what an interesting nose. You know, it's all about that. Be the best you can, be hard on yourself, be demanding on yourself, but like yourself. Be your best friend. I go, I go to sleep at night and I'm so glad I am me because, because I'm my best friend. And, be, and so what I would tell young people today is the most important relationship in life is the one you have with yourself. Because once you have that, any other relationship is a plus and not a must. Makes so much sense. Diane von Furstenberg, Princess Diane von Furstenberg, thank you so much for your time today and being on No Filter. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I just, I said to Derek, I was like, Diane, and he was like, let me call, I said, please, please ask Diane because we're gonna take a little hiatus soon. And I was like, we have to have Diane, you're just so much, just been, you're just an institution. So important for us. Thank you, Naomi. And you are also very important. You are a role model to so many you are light, you also carry a torch of freedom. And I love you, I respect I you, you, and I admire you. I love you too. Diane von Furstenberg, everybody. Bye. Words of wisdom, life lessons here today on No Filter. Take notes. And of course, please go out and get Own It. I love you, Diane. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love, love you, you darling. You. Bye. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, Diane von Furstenberg, what a lady. And we could go on and because she has seen and done so much and always is totally a chameleon, turning around, doing something unexpected. Inspiration. Thank you to our fashion oracle, DVF, Princess DVF. Please like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Saying to you, brown girls out.